Hello, welcome back. This is the sixth in a series of videos to teach a beginner how to weave a project from start to finish. Today we're going to be measuring our warp. From our last video, we've calculated how much warp we need. If you're just joining right now, I would suggest that you subscribe to my channel. I have a watch list with all the videos in order. You may want to start at the beginning and follow along from the very start. Each segment is a small portion of the learning process so that you can go back and watch exactly what you need to know. So today is the sixth in a series of videos and we're going to be winding a warp today. You're probably thinking, when are we going to start weaving? So far, there's a lot of preparation that goes into creating a project to weave. And warping is one of those things. It does take a little bit of time, but for me, it's an enjoyable time. I usually take my warping mill in front of the TV, sit and warp. Um, you don't need to count the threads as you're going. I'll show you how we keep track of how many threads we have on the warping mill. So. It's easy to just sit and enjoy yourself. We're gonna use this warping mill to measure the warp that we need for our project. From our calculations, we found that we need 88 inches of warp. And what we need to do first is to create a guideline. So as we're warping, we have something to follow. I'm gonna measure this yarn. I've chosen a yarn that's a different color and different weight. It's a little bit thicker than the wool that we'll be using. That just helps to differentiate between the um, yarn that you're using and this guide wire. Um, I'm going to leave a little bit extra at the end because we're going to be tying onto the pegs of the warping mill. And let me measure 88 inches. And again, a little extra to tie on with. And that creates our guideline. The warping mill is just a way to measure the threads and keep them in order as we go. Many people will use a warping board. Uh, the warping mill works the same as a warping board. I've created this mill myself. It's made from PVC pipe and um, with a little bit of drilling and some cutting it was very easy to assemble. And when winding longer warps, I really prefer the mill over the warping board. I've actually given my warping board to my sister, so I don't have that here to show you. I'll insert a picture so you can see what a warping board looks like. So we're going to use my warping mill. Mills can be either horizontal, which this is, or if it was flipped up to stand up and twirling around the other way, that would be a vertical mill. Um, the warping mill has three pegs here, and this is where we're going to create what's called a cross. As we warp, we want the threads to come together in a cross so that when we take it to the loom, we're able to discern which thread to take in what order. It keeps all the warp ends in order so that when we go to the loom, they're not tangled up, they're precisely the way we want them. To start with, I am just going to tie our guide line onto the first peg. And this will help us to determine a pattern to use across this warping mill. So first we come up around this peg, over that peg, and then as I turn the mill, we can see I'm too short to come up here. This peg here would be ideal. So on my warping mill, I can take a peg out from here, put it in the end here, and tie on. That gives us our 88 inch warp that we need. And that sets the pattern that we need to follow with our warping threads. I've decided to use a Shetland wool in a golden color and from our calculations, we've decided we need 126 warp ends at 88 inches long. I put this cone on the ground beside the warping mill, and 
I'm going to tie on to the first peg just as I did with the guideline. And we're just going to follow this guideline exactly. We come to the right of this peg, to the left of this peg, and follow it right around to this peg here. On this peg, we are going to just wrap around. And then we're going to follow that same course back again. When we come here to create the cross, we need to go opposite of what we did on this peg. So we're going to come to the right of this peg and around both of these pegs. And then we're going to go back again following the first line. And that was to the left of the peg here and following our guideline back again around this peg, back again, and this is where we came to the right of the first peg, left of the next two, up to the left of this peg again as we go back. When you're warping, you do not want to pull this warp ends too tight. If you do, you can cause these to bend in, and that's true on a wooden warp warping board or a warping mill as well. You do not want these lines to be tight. As you go, I always try to stay to the right of the previous warp end and around to the right again. As I go, I do push them together so that it stays nice and neat. When we get here, we come to the right of the first peg left of the next two, up, make our cross to the left, and we're going back again. We need 126 warp ends for this warp. I've tried to sit here and count 126, and it never works. Guaranteed, the doorbell will ring, your dog will want to go out, uh, some, the telephone will ring, something's going to stop you, and you're going to forget where you were. I find the easiest way to do this is to wind several of the warp ends and then count them. Depending on the length of the warp, I'll count them in bouts of 20 or 50 at a time. And to count them, I like to count them on this end because I know that Every end that comes over this peg, there's two ends. So if I'm counting this one, I would count two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve so far. So not nearly enough to start bundling them. Let me continue warping for a while, and then I'll stop, we'll count, and I'll show you how I tie off those ends to know precisely how many I have as I'm warping. I'm sitting on a office chair. I like this because I can raise and lower it. I like to keep my body straight as I'm doing all of the weaving projects. Because of the repetitive motion, if you're not sitting properly, if you're reaching or possibly hunching your back and straining your shoulders, um, it can cause muscle fatigue and aches and pains. So the more straight you can work, and I prefer to work from my shoulder to my knee. So this is ideal on this loop. When I'm finished winding this warp, I'm gonna show you how we chain it together or tie it together so that the threads all stay in perfect order. And 
then you can store a project that's ready to warp again. So I would say it's about time to count again. And we'll come back to where we were. Let me just switch. And I'm going to count off another 50. So if I simply count 25 and multiply it by 2, I know that there's 50. So instead of counting by 2s, I'm just going to count singles right now. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, and 25 is another 50 ends. And I'm just looping this thread around those 50 ends. And I'll sort of tie it off again so that it doesn't move around on us. So that's 100 total ends so far, and we need 126. 25, and this will make 26. So let me come back here and count to make sure that we have 26. I'm only counting the ones that are not within our counting threads here. So we've got 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 22, 24, 26. I want two extra threads on this warp. I have my 26 here. This will make 27. And then coming back to the cross again, we'll make 28. These two extra threads are what's called a floating salvage. When we get to putting this on the loom, I'll show you what the floating salvage is and why we need it. So we've made our warp a total of 128 ends. And I'm just going to cut it off here, tie it onto this last peg so that it won't fall off and won't go anywhere. Our warp is now wound. We have a total of 128 ends at 88 inches. To take it off of the warping mill, we first need to tie it in a few areas so that when we let go, this threads that are all nicely ordered right now don't tangle. I want to come back over to the cross. We need to tie what's called a choke tie. I like to do my choke tie first. It's something that we're going to tie to the breast of the loom. So I needed to know precisely how much space I need when we're threading. And that happens to be 31 inches on my loom. And that brings my choke to right about here. I take that same yarn that I've been using, a different color, different weight. And what I'm going to do, using it doubled up because I want to make this as tight as possible. I know for my loom, if I tie it right about here, that's the correct length. I'm moving this guideline out. I do not want to tie that in with my warp. I'm going to take this around, tie a knot, and I want to tie it as tight as I can. I don't want these threads to be able to move. So I come around and tie a good tight knot. Depending on the width of the warp, I'll tie that a couple times, but this is sufficient for today. The next thing, we do not want to lose this cross that we've made. This is what's keeping our threads in order, and that's how we'll know which one to pull off first as we start to thread the loom. So again, I'm going to take a piece of yarn and I'm wrapping that yarn right here between the cross. So I take it from the back. I wanna make sure that I have the warp threads and not our guideline and tie it so that that cross is held and we don't lose it. This one does not need to be that tight. I like to just snug and then I'll put a bow in it so that it's easy to take off again. Then we're going to put 
four more ties, one on each of the leg of the cross. That'll hold that separate. Again, we don't want to lose the way this is worked. We want the lines to stay in place as we are putting it on the loom. So these don't need to be tight, just enough to hold it so we don't lose the cross. And again, I like to put just a little bow there, another one here. If I put a bow in it, it's easier to pull out and there's less chance of me cutting the warp by mistake when I try to cut these lines off. One more here. On a very long warp, you may want to put a couple ties along the length of it so that it also doesn't uh, pull out. I'm just going to put one. Not really needed on this length, but just to show you, again, fairly loose, just enough to hold them in place. And then we come up to the end peg. What I'm going to do is brace this warping mill so that it doesn't spin as I take the warp off. To take the warp off, we just pull this peg out. I'm going to separate that line and just let that fall. And at the end of the warp, we're going to do what's called chaining the warp. If you're familiar with crochet, you'll know exactly what I'm doing. We're going to create a loop. What I do is hold this in my hand, hold this down, turn it, and I'm grabbing the rest of that warp and I'm going to pull it through to create a loop. Then I'm putting my hand, the other hand through, grabbing the loose end and pulling it through to create another loop. I'm going to switch my hands once again, grab it. The reason I'm switching my hands back and forth, if you stay on one hand and continually pull, it puts a twist into your warp chain. And when you're beaming the loom, threading the loom, it can cause a problem. So I keep switching back and forth until I have this in a nice braid. I'm now at my cross and there's my choke. So I know that that's far enough done. It's a fairly short warp actually. Uh, for our first project, that's ideal. That way we know nothing is going to get tangled. So we'll next go over to the loom and learn how to thread the reed.